Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And this is the podcast for June 20th, uh, 2021, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. The, uh, the thematic first reading is Job 38, 1 through 11. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading are selected verses from 1 Samuel 17. The psalm is Psalm 107, 1 through 3, and 23 through 32. The second reading is 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 3, and the gospel reading is Mark 4, 35 through 41, where Jesus seems um, curiously indifferent to the about-to-be-drowned status of his disciples. That's true, isn't it? Doesn't seem to doesn't seem to matter. So, uh, but here we are uh, with the stilling of the storm, and um, in in Mark, and you know, one of the things about this uh, about this story is is exactly what you said, Rolf. Right? Is like, you know, what do you do with what do you do with Jesus? Seemingly lack of, you know, yeah, care that they might just about to be drowned. What do you think is up with that? Well, what I think is up with it is um, the fact that uh, he's not worried because mm -hmm. he's Jesus. Right. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Like, I mean, you just wouldn't have to worry about anything because you're Jesus. But they, um, they don't know who he is yet. It's only yeah. Mark 4. So right. that's part of it. The, the drama of the first, you know, really what, seven and a half chapters of Mark is that they don't know who he is yet. They don't understand. Uh, and so one way uh, to, um, you know, kind of go through the first part of Mark is to preach the questions and the, uh, you know, the questions, uh, the question, the disciples question at the end is who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, and I think I think that's a great um, entry into this text is you know, who then is this? And particularly when you make some of the links back to what Jesus has already done. So the the verb in 439 uh, rebuking the wind is the same verb that Jesus uses to rebuke the demon or the unclean spirit in the first you know, in the first um, act of Jesus, the exorcism uh, in, as his first, you know, public act. And so there's that, that connection of, of uh, that, that ability of Jesus, right, to, uh, to cleanse the man, the spirit comes out of the man, and now to calm the seas. Uh, that I think that that connection is important, and that's part of what you know. Part of what we're hoping that the disciples see, right, is Jesus' power to be able to uh, to do both of those. So I think that's I think that's a connection that we are supposed to see is uh, Jesus' power to be able to um, obviously to perform that exorcism and now to calm the seas uh, is made in that use of that same verb. Yeah, I think it's key to help. You've, you've got to kind of re-haunt the world for people with this passage, that this is no ordinary storm. This is no ordinary lake. This is the, you know, the questions of geography and, and meteorology don't really apply so much to this passage, although they could be interesting to talk about, you know, surviving a, a particularly harsh storm, one that's harsh enough that it does terrify people, some of whom fish for a living, right, in this story. So uh, it's, not they're, it's not that they're necessarily cowardly mm -hmm. because of the storm, but there's something here that's bigger. There's something here that's more threatening. Uh, and it is that, that world full of, of other spirits. It's this world of a different kingdom that we looked, about, looked at back in Mark chapter three and this, this strong man that has to be bound. And so you've got to pull people into that that mythology, I think, of Mark's gospel to really get a sense of the drama here. The commentary on the website does a great job of doing that, by the way, if, mm -hmm. if people uh, want to read after watching the podcast, after watching or listening to the podcast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a good point, uh, Matt, that this is, um, 
that there is uh, this subterranean theme, right? This is not just like, well, that would be, it is a big deal to be able to calm a storm. I'm not saying that it isn't a big deal, but there's, there's more to it, particularly with that connection back to Jesus first, uh, Jesus first miracle or Jesus first act, right? Is that uh, there is, there are powers that are being uh, challenged, authorities, powers that are being challenged and even then controlled by Jesus. And so it invites homiletically to see what are those what are those powers? And we're going to see that, you know, going forward in the next couple of weeks, like with the death of Herod, uh, I mean, death of John the Baptist, the ways in which all authorities or what we what we think has power in our world is being uh, is being challenged or overthrown by Jesus presence. Uh, and so I think that the key or challenge homiletically is to invite people to think about what that is. And so, as you said, re-haunt the world I, I, is an important aspect of that. And maybe there is something as we move through preaching uh, in, in a kind of also semi-post pandemic <laughs> that we're still, we're still in that space, but maybe there is something in a connection to that, you know, that the ways in which we recognize that there are these these powers uh, in our in uh, in our world that threaten our very existence uh, and our way of being, and so this is actually not too far afield uh, if we if we start making those kinds of connections. Yeah, and if you want to think <clears throat> kind of more thematically or poetically about that, it, it is this idea of powers. <clears throat> It's also this notion of thresholds of Jesus being in these threshold places and, mm -hmm. you know, where the land meets the sea is obviously one of those, which is, uh, which is where he was at the beginning of this, at the beginning of this story. Uh, he's crossing the sea, the, the implication probably moving from predominantly Jewish areas, although not entirely, but at least the villages that he's been in. When he gets on the eastern edge of the sea, he's probably in a more predominantly Gentile place. There is a sense of him being at these edge spots, and we'll see that again in chapter five when he's with <clears throat> a woman who's suffering from a hemorrhage and and a um, uh, and a young girl who dies. That he's at these these places where where order meets chaos and where life meets up with death. So that's one thing that a preacher can think about. But also, I think when talking about these powers, to name explicitly the power of death mm -hmm. in all of these is really important. Uh, and I'm guilty of this myself. Sometimes we we kind of summarize or 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 metaphorize the the idea of these unclean spirits as evil and i think evil is maybe not quite the right word as as far as much as as death is these are death dealing spirits these are things that that um work against life and human flourishing and in the same way uh the storm and the sea represent that same kind of threat uh as well that, that what he's what he's showing control over are the things that make for destruction of human well-being. And we'll see that again next week in chapter five. We'll see that again, I think, with Herod and John, where you get a sense that these powers are also located in real human authorities and real human systems as well. And the, and the passage, the story, of course, that we skip uh, when we move to the hemorrhaging woman and Jairus's daughter is the healing of the garrison demoniac, which is also representative of that uh, as well. And so you can bring that in too to say Jesus is, uh, you know, it's to speak of thresholds. Then Jesus is moving into a, a yet another place of place of death of of the way in which the spirit has completely taken over this this person, and how Jesus is going to you know, uh, basically give him new life or resurrect him and, and to a certain extent. And so that's, that, that could be another thing, not just to Jairus's, you know, Jairus's daughter and the hemorrhaging woman, but to the garrison demoniac as well. Yeah, which is, it's so key because you are setting, we're gonna spend a lot of time obviously in Jesus public ministry uh, throughout the rest of this year with a, with a brief foray into the bread of life in, in, in August. And Can't we wait. Know, Caroline, you're already, Making your charts and graphs for, for helping us with John's gospel. But how do you how do you show what is it about Jesus ministry that was so compelling, that was so odd, bizarre, and peculiar and confusing, but also that was so you know dangerous, that was so upsetting to the authorities? And to talk about 
the way in which he's engaging these powers of death is really, I think, a, a key way to do that. The the one last thing I think I'll say about this is uh, David Schnaffs Jacobson's commentary that I talked about that's that's so good, describes this as the boat ride from hell, yeah. uh, which is a great line. I would call it the, I'd correct that slightly and say it's more like the boat ride to hell, right? He's he's mm -hmm. going into this this again this place this this haunted this enchanted place um, where there's real resistance to him and his ministry, um, and it is terrifying for those who witness this. And so that contrast between Jesus, I'm not so sure he's not caring, but he's just not worried. Mm -hmm. And the disciples, you just need to, know, people need to know, I think that verse 41 is probably a mistranslation in the NRSV. It's probably they were terrified is much mm -hmm. better than they were filled with great awe. Right. Um, they probably couldn't get out of the, get, get, get to dry land fast enough, right? And yeah. back into the sunshine and still air. Yeah. Um, this is terrifying, not both because of him and the power he shows, but what they've just stared into. Yeah, and and the commentary mentions that that it you know it's literally filled with a great fear uh, and not awe, and uh, and and I think one last thing, and then we should move to the uh, thematic uh, to Job. But one last thing too is uh, is the contrast between the the parables right that you get in chapter four of jesus sort of explaining if you will or or offering these parabolic metaphorical images of what the kingdom of god is like uh and the and it where and how and not do the disciples quite get what's going on and the contrast of that sort of explanation teaching to this dramatic act of of the selling of the storm to reveal Jesus identity and I, i'm not quite sure where to go with that but i think it's i think it's an important contrast of of you know these these parables but then really Jesus sort of embodying what he's trying to get at in in the in the stilling of the storm yeah, I, I think we have to say we should be clear about that, right? Which is in some ways, like if this was a journalism class, the author here uh, buries the lead uh, because it ends with who is this? So what's at stake is Jesus' identity, right? Mm -hmm. So like the lead should be Jesus, son of God, the Messiah, still storm. I mean, because yeah. so, who is it? It's and that's what's at stake is uh, is the entry of the Son of God into human history in order to still the storms, quell the fears, drive out the unclean spirits, you know, and eventually usher in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Job. 30. Yeah, this is one of these, you know, um, so it's so thematically paired, I, I suppose, because of the line in there, uh, were you there when I shut in the sea with doors when it burst out of the womb? Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, so Brennan Breed in his commentary on the website tries to situate, you know, boom, you got you got a thousand words on the com a commentary to situate this within the long plot of Job. And this is chapter 38 when God finally shows up. Um, and so Brennan does that on the website. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna preach on this, that's what you have to do. Is you have to situate this within the plot of Job. And there's um, there's a couple different ways of understanding the plot of Job. On the website, uh, Brennan chooses uh, the one, which is the question of dis whether it, there is uh, Old Testament scholars talk about it like this: Is there such a thing as disinterested piety? That is, does Job only love God because God has given him, has made him one of the wealthiest men in the world? But the other way of understanding the plot of Job is, is the, uh, does God rule the world according to the doctrine of just retribution, which is that um, God punishes uh, the wicked and rewards the righteous? And if that's the way you understand it, then the, then the, the typical way of understanding this is to say there's three corners of a triangle and you can only have two. God is good, one corner. A second corner, Job is righteous, 
The third corner is the, is the just retribution. God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. You can't have all three corners of the triangle. And I think that's what this is about. Uh, or I think that's one way to, it's the best way of understanding this, which is, so finally, when God talks, he says, do you have understanding? Uh, do you know how the world works? I'm the creator. Are you, are you right to question me about the fact that I don't run the world according to punishing the wicked and rewarding the righteous? Yeah. Well, and maybe if you're, maybe you don't want to go down the whole Job world preaching thing, but I, but maybe you can, if you're going to preach on Mark and preach uh, the, it, the identity, as you said at the end there, Rolf, of who Jesus is and recognizing yeah. Jesus' power, that uh, that power is, and it is, you know, bringing the kingdom of God to bear. And so the way in which you can bring in perhaps lines from Job to say, this is what, this is what the kind of power we're talking about. Uh, the, the kind of power that God has of who were you and where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth, you know? Uh, and so that's what I would do is I would say, you know, how can you use some lines in Job to, uh, to underscore uh, the, the, the kind of authority that Jesus needs his disciples to recognize? I suppose yeah, the, the same. Go ahead, Matt. And the same is true of Psalm 107, that, that if you wanted in your sermon to, to focalize that final question, right, who then is this that even the, mm -hmm. the wind and the waves obey him, the wind and the sea obey him, people are sometimes surprised to learn and delighted to learn that there were other miracle workers in Jesus' time, right, other thaumaturges, right, other, other, other wonder workers there's something about this particular miracle or this intervention or this act of Jesus that's particularly impressive. Um, and so when the disciples ask that question, it's not like they don't have any kind of a foundation to build on. Mm -hmm. Some of the terror might be because they think they might know the answer. Or they think they might know where the evidence is pointing them. And that could be because of passages like Job 38 and Psalm 107. And so to lead people into that, into you know, an understanding of, you know, a Jewish understanding, an Old Testament understanding of God's power over these things that from a human perspective appear to be utterly untamable, things like weather and seas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and just to pull that up then a little bit more, yeah. right? So what, what does it right. mean then to stare into the works of God and, and think you know what you're seeing? And we talked about that with Mark 3, right? What blasphemy against the Holy Spirit was to be confronted with the acts of God and to attribute them, you know, wrongly to the devil. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of where they're at. That's the threshold that they're standing at, at the end of that passage, not to take things back to Mark for too quickly, but yeah. But I, that's what I would do with the Psalm. I mean, I, how, how, and how can you use Job and the Psalm to uh, really to uh, build that up for Mark? That's what I would do. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is in, I should not the interesting thing. One interesting thing is, is that in Job, God speaks out of the whirlwind so that the, 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 the chaos storm is, this, is the revelation itself. Whereas in uh, Psalm 107 and more explicitly in Mark, uh, God is the one who rescues from the storm. So mm -hmm. you've got a contrast there. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to say about Psalm 107 is it's this long psalm. Uh, a couple months ago, we had, uh, I think the the next, or we had a different part of Psalm 107. I can't remember if it's the next stanza or if it's the previous one, because there's four stanzas after that first three verse introduction, then there's four different, very uh, similarly constructed um, stanzas where it talks about some, in this case, it's some went down to the sea in ships. Uh, in others, it's, you know, they were fools or they were sick, depending on how you translate that one. And so it, it is a chance uh, to, to kind of compare those two. And, and in each case, it's, um, you know, some were in prison. And the point is that they, they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them. And so you get 
different sets of pilgrims. Our old colleague, our, our retired colleague, she, I don't mean she's old, she's retired. Diane Jacobson talks about um, different groups of um, pilgrims. She talks about uh, who um, God, who are examples of God's redeeming acts. And, and this is another one of those. And the commentary on that portion of the Psalm is from March 14. Thank you. 2021. And it is the previous stanza then, right? It's Correct. the third. Yeah. It's the third of the four stanzas. Right. Yep. This is one more reason why I'm a New Testament scholar, because I like the New Testament view of weather a lot better than the Old Testament one. That these things are things that God needs to save you out of. God wants to put you somewhere where the, the wind is calm and it's sunny and beautiful. That God is not present when it's raining or snowing or windy. You prefer the New Testament meteorological The Old Testament suggests, I think, I think the New Testament is much more, I've got a nice, quiet, peaceful garden for you to enjoy. Uh, Sit back and relax. A it's hard to argue with that. Yep. <laughs> well, speaking right. of a nice, quiet garden uh, to enjoy, that's what David doesn't have in the semi-continuous Old Testament reading. Yes. First uh, Samuel 17. Well, uh, that's true. And I, you know, one thing I, uh, I appreciated about the commentary with regard to this is that, you know, we, we focus so much on David uh, and the David cycle. And that's obviously what the, what the lectionary is doing. And, uh, and of, of course, um, and of course, what people will focus on with this story is like the last line, because what the last line in the pericope of, of the famous David, you know, slaying the giant. Uh, but the whole question around uh, of Saul's, you know, uh, unraveling. Uh, I think it's a really interesting, could be a really interesting way to get at this and particularly to see how, you know, to take a well-known story like, you know, David slaying the, <laughs> David slaying the giant and then pointing out, do you notice that that's only like one verse? The rest of this, the rest of this pericope is really exploring uh, what's happening to Saul and what difference does that make? So I thought that was that's, that's the direction I would go. I'm not quite sure what I would do with that homiletically, but. Yeah, I'm not sure about, um, I'm not sure that I think that this is about Saul. I, I think it's a lot about Goliath defying Israel's God, that uh, the, a lot of the drama in the story is, uh, so veggie tales uh, were big when, when I think all of our kids were little. And uh, the way veggie tales and the way really the, the whole world uh, treats the David and Goliath story. It's uh, as the veggie tale said is little guys can do big things too. And so a David and Goliath story is about the little guy beating the big guy. Um, whether it's a uh, uh, March, March madness basketball game or, or some business, uh, you know, industrial story, but uh in the text, if if you if somebody were just to go and read the whole chapter through, it's about. I think it's a lot about um, Goliath defying and mocking Israel's God, and then uh, David. David says, "Hey, um, it's the Lord uh, who is going to save me, not me." And then even Saul gets that right. Go and may the Lord be with you. Um, I just want to point out that the story doesn't end with with David defeating Goliath and Goliath falling to the ground. The story really ends. He hacks off his head. Where David takes his severed head back to Jerusalem. Oh, so there's I'm that just, too. I'm just yeah. saying there's that. I, Not know, to Jerusalem. This they is, left they left that part out of Veggie Tales. This is a horrifically long passage, <laughs> and so I can't imagine adding verses there, but It'll it'll wake up the kids, the, the adolescents in the congregation. Wait, wait, that part that. was not, that part wasn't in the story. Especially if you have a bag like a tote bag slung over the side of the altar, and, and make people wonder what's in it. But <sighs> this yeah. is just a hard passage to preach because it's so long, because it's so familiar, and I don't know. I think it's just kind of David hagiography. It kind of bugs me, but um, well, that's true too. But um, 
It's hard but, to find a lot of theology in here beyond. That's why I want to focus on Saul, but. On Psalms? Saul. Oh, Saul. I thought we had a breakthrough there. No, Saul. That's why I want to focus on Saul. And is well, it is the uh, it, it it is that about David, but even David here in this story is um, finally not the hero. It's it's the Lord delivering Israel. I mean, so you were talking earlier about um, the unclean spirits aren't necessarily evil. The storm isn't necessarily evil. You can even, you, you can set up with the Philistines. The Philistines are just doing what uh, a neighboring tribe would do in those days, trying to survive. They're not evil, but here is God delivering Israel out of the hands of the uh, of a nation who arrived in the Promised Land at the same time and was contesting uh, with Israel for the land. God's keeping the promise of that Israel will have a land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's your title philistine's gonna philistine <laughs> all right <laughs> you know they are and by the way that's why we call it palestine today because of the philistines little uh tidbit there a little just well, a little thanks, uh, yeah the, the romans kind of like saying hey we should like give the phil yeah i mean that's where the the name comes from is all i was saying yeah a little geographical tidbit Always so, see, I was just trying to help Caroline, the geography maven, with that <laughs> it's one. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, I've got to up my game. All right, we've got, so, uh, can, let's move on. Yes. Second Corinthians 6. Yeah, Corinthians, we have three of five. This is our third of five readings from Second Corinthians. Uh, and uh, yeah, dropping into chapter six. Well, it, he, he needs so much context, especially the way the lectionary has chosen the Second Corinthians passages. I know. So people need to know that in this part of the letter, um, Paul, as you know, the lead author, is is trying to establish reconciliation between himself and the Corinthians because the Corinthians are really mad at, at him and his partners, and and this is the climax to that earliest to the that main appeal that, that dominates so much of chapters one through seven but it's 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 hard to see it's in verses 11 through 13 right this idea of you know we're opening wide ourselves uh to you open wide your hearts in return i mean this is a, a plea for reconciliation which sounds kind of boring in general but you have to recognize that so much of the theology beforehand has tried to open this door um Sano, you could talk a little bit about reconciliation. We've had previous passages that set that up as well. But you have to make people understand that reconciliation isn't just about, let's go back to the way things were, that, that reconciliation is how do you move forward into a new future together uh, and, and kind of appreciate what that means theologically and how that's predicated on what God does through Christ. And I think one of the port important theological themes um, in this passage with regard to what you just said, Matt, is that the, that the premise of the possibility of this reconciliation and, uh, and, and that future relationship is based on God's grace and the power of God's grace. And so that, 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 that activity uh, and that, um, that move toward reconciliation and relationship is is can't, is not possible without the grace of God, and so you get that in that first line, not to accept the grace of God in vain. That uh, it is the grace of God that is going to allow this to happen. So that's a that could be a, that could be a homiletical direction one could take. That's a good point. I mean, especially when you think next week we're going to get to the the fundraising part of Second Corinthians, <laughs> where Paul is going to be asking for generosity and a gift to Jerusalem, but grace will be such an important part of that appeal as well. Then two weeks down the road will be Paul has his, his trip, that's the right word to use, his trip into the third level of heaven and sees things he's not permitted to talk about. And, but there too, it'll be the notion of strength being sufficient for weakness and, and similar here where Paul's going to talk about what sustains him, whether it's a broken relationship whether it's the need for support for congregations, whether it's Paul's own 
back and forth with the super apostles in chapter 12, it's going to be this notion of a God who sustains through grace.